Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. Good. I'm in a good uh, mood. Uh, you want to know why? Uh, because I'll tell you, we're, we're about to do one of our our most popular uh, features here on Blogging Heads TV, which is to subject you to ritual humiliation over your rash prediction that Brokeback Mountain would not be a commercial success. The weekend uh, grosses have just come out, and it did eight million this weekend, putting it at forty-two million, within striking distance of the fifty million that you said it would never reach, which it should reach. Boy, that that. That was a mistake. You trapped me into fifty million is way too low. I'm moving the goalposts. I know you've moved them in a lot of ways. I mean, one thing you said is, "Oh, okay, but it won't do well in the, in the red states." And I think I can predict your next fallback position after it does well in the red states. You're going to say, "Okay, it's doing well in some red states, but that's only in major metropolitan areas." Well, you know, if you go out into into rural areas, they're, they're like uh, they're, they're they're not showing it at like future farmers of America conventions or something like that. Well, it may it may come to that, Bob, but. First, if you go to the comments on, uh, you know, Donnie Fowler, uh, a Huffington Post blogger, wrote a, wrote a blog on him saying, ha, 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 it's playing in the red states. And he got all these comments back from people in the red states saying, I live in a town of two million that's playing in one theater. Uh, the, the test of whether this, one test of whether this movie uh, plays is a cultural phenomenon as a, a runaway phenomenon, as Frank Rich of the New York Times said it would be is what happens when it opens wide. Well, this is the first weekend where it's opened wide. It, it did well the first weekend. Let's see if it, had, if it has legs. Obviously, it's going to do better than 50 million. It's going to do 65 to 70 million at least. Maybe a little more if it wins the Academy Award. But here's some perspective. Fahrenheit 9-11, which didn't seem to have a hell of a lot of impact on the red states, did 119 million. Okay, This film is not going to get anywhere near that. The English Patient, which is another sort of doomed romance between star-crossed lovers, except they're hetero lovers, uh, did, in inflation-adjusted terms, $111 million. Yeah, but that one, so I don't think you go from I don't think picture. Name one other romance that is not a comic romance that has done more than $50 million. Well, there are plenty of other ones. I will solve And, you will, and you will I'll, cite them next week, probably. I'll, no, I'll, I'll put them in Afterthoughts. How about that? The Afterthoughts section, which is right down there underneath us uh, on the site. Okay, okay. Well, do you feel humiliated enough for us to move on? I'm supposed to be squirmy and flinchy and, and evincing my, uh, you know, my uncomfortableness with my sexuality. So I don't think we've reached that point yet. Well, do, we, do about five seconds of that and we'll move on. Maybe we have. Okay. This doesn't require a soundtrack. Okay. Um, consider it done. Okay. Uh, now, Bob, I, I think... We've had complaints that we go on too long, so I'm, uh, we're interested in a technical innovation here, which is the timer. I have a beautiful red kitchen Great timer. Great idea. Um, and I'm going to set it for five minutes. It doesn't mean we can't talk for more than five minutes, but, but it, it means there will be a cautionary buzzer that sounds okay. when we go in overtime. So I'm winding the timer now. So wait, it's going to be a buzzer I should live in fear of? It's going to be a bell. It's, it's a bell. It sounds like a phone ringing. Okay. Uh, okay, I just wanted to know what I should uh, studiously ignore. Yeah, no, that means shut up. Okay, so I said it. Um, I feel the pressure. Can I start okay. talking now? Yeah. I want to say a few words about Mark Warner, who is being talked up as, you know, the, the, president, the Democratic presidential candidate who could win in red states. I've, I've now listened to two interviews with him, and I'm starting to think he may wind up being an immense nothing burger. He uh, shows some eerie parallels with John Kerry in, in, in seeming to be completely risk-averse. Uh, the only, uh, only things he, he says are things that, that, that have been, you know, focus group tested to prove that they will not offend anyone, uh, but at the same time don't excite anyone. Um, he, uh, you know, he, he uh, on George Stephanopoulos, you know, he, he, he is, first of all, he, he's, He's refused to say, even at this point, whether invading Iraq was, was a good idea. But beyond that, it, it's even worse than that. Uh, he, was, uh, he was going through a, a series of vacuous, inoffensive talking points uh, on Iraq, and Stephanopoulos uh, threw him a question about whether we had enough troops when we went into Iraq. Uh, and he's so intent on getting through his talking points that he sidestepped that, which is a complete free throw, you know. Our military which is the best in the world, did his job. Uh, they are extraordinary men and women. I've seen, as commander of the National Guard in Virginia, a lot of our 
National Guard deployed to Iraq. But did we have enough troops there well, to keep let's, the peace? Well, let me go through this first. Number two. One thing, one thing everyone agrees on is that we didn't have enough troops going into into Iraq. I mean, right. that's a no-lose talking point, Even and, and Paul he didn't Brown, have enough right. dexterity to seize it. Um, I, I just, uh, he seems like a likable enough guy when you see him on TV. I think he's got, he's got kind of, uh, kind of a good, a good face for the job because on the one hand he looks kind of formidable. It's he's kind of a little chiseled, but on the other hand he's kind of. A little pockmarked, so you think, well, he had acne in high school, so he couldn't have been too big he, an asshole, you know? He's not stiff and formal the way Kerry is. He isn't stiff and formal? No, he's slow and cautious, but not stiff and formal. Right. He, he, he's, a little, he's a little robotic, though, but by, by, out, you know, by virtue of being so slow and cautious. But, but I, mean, I just, you know, there's kind of nothing to, to latch on to. There's no reason to affirmatively like the guy uh, in terms of policies, in terms of things he says. Uh, I sense his bubble is uh, his bubble is bursting just just by reading the note. You can tell that everybody was enthusiastic about him a month, you know, two months ago, and now they're less enthusiastic. So his his initial 50 minutes. He may be uh, thinking too over. much about the general election. He, he seems like he's trying hard to avoid uh, antagonizing red state people, but you know, there's there's a big hurdle before between him and the general. And the guy who's throwing caution to the winds is Al Gore. There you go. That's because he's not sure he's running yet, even though, as you've said, his unconscious mind knows that he is don't, running. Don't you think he has? Don't you think he has enough discipline not to get cautious if he actually runs? I mean, he's, he said, "I'm not going to take consultants. I, you know, I'm not going to listen to those people anymore. I'm going to say what I think. I'm going to let it rip." Uh, you know, I've always thought we don't really want to see the inner gore let rip, but uh, but I, it's hard to believe after that that he's going to turn into another carry. Yeah, I don't think he can after that. It's, uh, it's, it's Hillary who's going to turn into another Kerry. I mean, she's the ultra-cautious one. Well, right. She, she and Warner are both being a little too risk-averse for their own good, I think. Uh, she's trying to compensate for risk aversion on policy by um, saying kind of sharp things about Bush, which is more than, than Mark Warner she, is doing. And, and, and those, of course, got her into she, little trouble with Republicans, but she may be smart enough to know that Republicans aren't her problem. Uh, but she, until she's been doing that for years, and now the press is totally onto her. I mean, I, my standard is if Cookie Roberts says something on this week, it's the conventional wisdom. And she said on this week that Hillary's trying to go left on rhetoric while staying right on policy, and that's exactly right. But A, the media is onto it, and B, the grassroots Democrats are onto it. I mean, Molly Ivins wrote an incredibly oh, yeah. angry column. Uh, about how she'll never vote for Hillary, even if Hillary's the Democratic nominee. That was harsh, yeah. Uh, we're sort of seeing a split in the Democratic Party between the, the party that sticks to the net roots and the party that actually wants to win national elections. It's sort of almost unbridgeable. I mean, you sort of can't see even Hillary. You know, if Hillary ran into, the, you know, Marcos, who runs the Daily Cause, uh, would they could they even interact? I mean, they're like from different planets now. Right. Uh, so, um, well, uh, and I've been out to two West L.A. dinner parties where we tried to figure out who we wanted to run for president. Mm -hmm. And not only could we not figure out a Democratic candidate who, who was, like, mentioned or could, could conceivably run who we wanted to run for president, we couldn't figure out anybody in the entire country you know, an industrialist, and you know, there's always usually some apolitical industrialist who one wants to run for president. My, my uh, name didn't come up. Sorry. My name didn't come up. Your name didn't come up. Mike Mike Kinsley's wife, Patty Stonecipher's name, is the only name that consistently came her. up because she's doing great things at the Gates Foundation, and people uh, admire her leadership. She's got my vote. Uh, but but that's that that's it. Uh, uh, and I, I tried to say that, well, you get Mike Kinsley, too, with that, and that didn't seem, you know, this was a very liberal crowd. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> what, what somebody pointed out on McLaughlin Group that one thing Al Gore has that probably nobody else has is he can afford to be cagey for a while because he could jumpstart a campaign in, in, in a very short period of time, and nobody else could quite do that. All he'd have to do is announce, and it would make, make a huge stir. Right, although there'll be pressure on him from the other candidates to declare now, so I don't run and get run over by you later. Um, that was the, that was the uh, resident tone of our timer. Oh, but well, worked like a charm. Okay, we're done with that. Uh, I think uh, the next topic is uh, 
the Palestinian elections? Okay, they are going to happen, and they're big. They're very big. Even bigger than the Canadian elections? Hard to imagine, I know, but I do think that, that yes, uh, the, the, that part of the world has more to do with, with the future stability of the whole world than Canada does. Um, did, did Canada have elections well, or something? They're having them today, Bob. Oh, I feel the, yeah, I feel the thrill <laughs> emanating from um, the Great White North. Uh, and they're actually going to change parties, but that's our discussion of the Canadian elections. Uh, in the Palestinian elections, I noticed Hamas, as predicted by you, is, is liberalizing in an attempt to win, actually win the election. Uh, and they have, uh, the, one of their leaders uh, said that negotiations with Israel through a third party were not off the table, not out of the question. That's, I think, a step forward for them. Yeah, it's not a huge concession. And since Israel refuses to talk to them, it's not enough. But uh, I, I would emphasize more the likelihood that actually being in political power would have a moderating influence on, on Hamas, as it often has on groups like that. In any event, I kind of think that at this point, you know, it's almost Hamas doing well in this election, maybe even winning, is almost the thing to hope for just because all other possibilities seem to have been exhausted. I mean, with the status quo, you know, uh, Hamas has become so strong among the Palestinians that there, there's no way that, the, that, that Fatah or, or a, you know, a, the, the Palestinian Authority um, under, under Fatah's le sole leadership can clamp down on Hamas, as, as various Israeli and American politicians are always demanding. They've got to clamp down on Hamas. They can't. Hamas is just too powerful. Uh, and I think, given that, and I might say that, that, that I think uh, Ariel Sharon was complicit in making Hamas as powerful as it's become, uh, as was, of course, Yasser Arafat in a different way. Um, but, but in any event, uh, given that, that fact, it seems to me that, that the next thing to try is give them the burden of actual power, um, which puts them in a completely different frame of mind, and, and see how they do. That, that makes sense to me. Are we playing it wrong somehow by making it seem like it would be a terrible defeat for us if Hamas did very well? Well, there's, there's two questions. I mean, it came out today that, that America has spent $2 million and not, not especially made a point of calling attention to it uh, to help uh, Fatah candidates in recent mm -hmm. weeks. Um, two questions. Was it smart to try to help them? And secondly, uh, is it a good thing that that now gets publicized? I think the answer to the second question is... If they wanted to help Fatah, then the, then the answer to the second question is no. This has got to, I, I think this has got to help Hamas when it comes out that there's a, you know, an American Zionist conspiracy behind Fatah, as it will be played over there. Um, so it, it looks like it was probably, in one sense or another, a, a, a bad policy, although if, if you agree with me that, that it may just, we may just be better off with Hamas being, uh, you know, assuming power, then, then maybe it'll be a perversely productive policy, but... Uh, right, but uh, doesn't this, in, in, in a larger sense, doesn't this mean you're again endorsing the intellectual engine at the heart of neoconservative foreign policy, which is Seems unlikely, democracy is the solvent of terrorism, that if you uh, have democracies, we don't have to worry so much about terrorists getting elected because the very act of having to compete for votes and exercise power will moderate them. Uh, and it's just a question of timing after that. I'm a, Once you've endorsed that. I'm a long-standing champion of democracy as a tool in the war on terror. My big difference is I, I, I'm skeptical of invading countries to impose democracy. Um, and so that, that's the only place I've ever really disagreed with the neocons is how you get to the democracy. My view is you don't have to do nearly as much as they think you do because history, technological history in particular, is, is, is favoring increasingly uh, free markets, uh, economic liberty, and that in turn favors uh, political liberty. It's a long-term, uh, sometimes chaotic process, but that seems to be the, the trend. That's the sweep of things. This isn't so long-term. They've had democracy in, in Palestine for a couple of years, and already Hamas is changing its tune. It seems pretty quick to me. Well, no, but I mean the way that the way that technology abets ultimately, uh, you know, democracy. I mean, I mean, the reason they're having more democracy in, in Palestine has a lot more to do with the fact that Yasser Arafat died than it has to do with any other thing. Right. I think. But you're casting aside. You 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 don't buy any of the Sco the Scowcroftian objections to the invasion of Iraq, which is. Oh, those primitive people can't get it together. They'll never be. They won't be democratic. No, for I'm centuries. not a depressing realist. Okay. I'm a progressive realist.
Uh, that's a term that's, that's, a, good, that, that's a very good uh, sentiment on which to end that segment. Yes, thank you. Zawahiri, uh, we talked about that a bit last time. He's... We still don't know whether he's alive or dead. Yeah, uh, you know, you played the Hitler card last time when we talked about Zawahiri, and, and that, that, that kind of Always put me off balance. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to supplement my reaction to that. As you may recall, I was raising the question, at least for purposes of provocation, is killing Zawahiri, the, the number two guy in al-Qaeda, would it be worth considerably antagonizing uh, people in, in the Muslim world, and I was suggesting it was not, not self-evident that the answer is yes, because for one thing, when you kill somebody, they're going to get replaced uh, in an organization like Al-Qaeda, and it may be that they'll be replaced by somebody more effective than them. You said, then you're saying we shouldn't, it wouldn't have been smart to kill Hitler, and I immediately said, oh no, I was all for killing Hitler, and, and, and I pointed to a lot of differences between that that case in this case, and they were valid differences. I stand by. I agree. That, I, actually, thought I, I, I thought I was convinced. I remember. No, being no, it made but... sense as far as it went. But in thinking about it, I thought actually there there would have been times during World War II when killing Hitler might not have been optimal because after all, he's the one who committed the fatal blunder of turning on his Russian allies and invading Russia, and that I think kind of sealed his doom. If before that you had killed him and he had been replaced by somebody who shared his goals but was not as crazy, we would have had a harder time winning that war. And there's actually possibly a parallel with Zawahiri, which is that he made, uh, well, he and, and bin Laden together, and I don't know who was more influential, they made a, a, apparently a strategic blunder not that long ago. It was when Zarqawi, different guy, uh, you know, who, who runs the, 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 uh, the foreign jihadist operation in Iraq, who was at that point not affiliated with al-Qaeda, he wanted to adopt the al-Qaeda brand to get some legitimacy, and he approached them. And, and meanwhile, uh, al-Qaeda was not making waves in any other fashion in the world, and they wanted to show that they were of some consequence. So they figured, yeah, you, you'll, you'll carry the al-Qaeda brand. We'll take credit for what you're doing. You're officially a, a deputy of, of uh, al-Qaeda. Right. And... That seems to have backfired on them because Zarqawi is such a madman that now the, the name Al-Qaeda is synonymous with blowing up mosques, which... Well, so now's the time to kill him because they made the well, blunder. Well, I mean, uh, fine, they, arguably, they, 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 like they, I said, I, don't, I, generally, I genuinely don't know what the answer is to the question. I was just making the point that for various reasons, it's not as simple as, okay, Al-Qaeda is the enemy kill as many of them as possible, regardless of the consequences. In a lot of little ways, it's more complicated th than that, including the question of what kind of blowback is generated by the manner in which we kill them and how many right. civilians we kill in the process and so on. Right. There was an interesting letter to the editor in the Washington Post that said, imagine if, if, if Zawahiri were holed up in a, in a house in Europe or in the United States with a bunch of women and children, would we take him out with a missile strike? And... This, this uh, person thought the answer was obviously no, so therefore we, we value... I think the answer uh, is obviously lives. no, don't you? Well, well... I mean, as a well, matter two, of politics, a president wouldn't do it, right? Two points. We killed a lot of people in Waco. Uh, yeah, but we didn't 50. plan to. That, that just went haywire. It was incredibly callous disregard. If you see Waco rules of engagement... It, it's Fine, just unbelievable. but if you think Clinton would have okayed a missile strike guaranteed to kill those kids, you know... You're crazy. No, but what about, uh, okay, my second example is the uh, SLA shootout in Los Angeles where we basically, the L.A. cops basically burned down a whole house. The, the, the analogy doesn't work because if somebody's here, we're, my earpiece fell out, sorry. You're this telling is, me. So did your microphone. My microphone. This is uh, the excitement of live TV. Um, if somebody's here, we have control of them, so we don't have to resort to a missile strike. We can surround their house and smoke them out. Uh, so it doesn't quite, the analogy doesn't work. No, but it's an interesting moral thought experiment. I agree, and I, th and I, th and I think the writer may be right. I just think of all these incidents like the move, the move situation in Philadelphia where there were... That was a mistake, too. They didn't expect that to go up in flames, I don't think. But anyway, it... it um, the the the, the wake, in Waco people is a little it's a little marginal because the DEA agents really were, were may have been out for revenge. Yeah, but the argument made to Clinton was the kids are in danger right now and we're going in to save them. Right, right, but 
the actual decision makers on the ground knew better than that. Um, well, okay, so um, we may even beat the timer on this one. Yeah, well, the mere, the mere existence of the timer has completely transformed my way of thinking. Have you noticed how concise and to the point I am? You, yes, yes. Um, we like that in you. Yeah. Okay. Um, what a, uh, we got it under the gun. Okay, and, and the last one is, uh, is uh, the question of Darwinian aesthetics. Uh, yeah. I found myself a couple times uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks yeah, you arguing said that, that our taste in automobiles is in our genes. Our taste in automobiles and in other things, uh, uh, like whether we want to go see Brokeback Mountain, uh, is in our genes. And uh, a friend of mine pointed me to this book, The uh, Evolution of Allure, that argues that... Uh, our, our tastes are in our genes, and because of sexual selection, we will emulate whatever artistic representation is on the screen. Therefore, we evolve in ways that that uh, that, that that trail sort of what artists say we should look like. So, you know, uh, Paris Hilton is all the rage, and all of a sudden, all women want to look like Paris Hilton, and men want to mate with women that look like Paris Hilton. They produce a bunch of children that look like Paris Hilton. And all of a sudden, the ideal of feminine beauty becomes Paris Hilton-esque, much the way mobsters emulate what the Godfather says they should talk like. So, so th they're saying that there's been significant genetic evolution undergirding our aesthetic preferences since the advent of, of art. I mean, I mean, they're talking about over the last few thousand years. I think that is what this professor, George L. Hersey, argues, yes. Well... Uh, the perfect antidote for that is uh, an article in the Australian by Dennis Dutton, who's, who's a smart guy and a serious philosopher, uh, which does assert, I think correctly, that there are aesthetic universals that are part of our, the psychology of our species that are, that are you know, genetically uh, undergirded, but notes that they have evolved over the, the course of the Pleistocene epic or era or whatever it is, which is like more than a million years uh, and, and, and I think in that piece he says, uh, so they would, they would not have changed significantly, you know, since the building of the first cities. And, and that is certainly the view of, of uh, the Darwinians I talk to, is that there has not been time uh, since the advent of civilization um, or, or even probably agriculture uh, to, for, for there to be significant genetic evolution. So... The, the, the aesthetic preferences were shaped in, in more like a hunter-gatherer environment and, and, and not, not by Greek artists. It, seem, it seems that if this, uh, if this professor, the evolution of Allure author, is right, women would look like this. They'd look like Picasso's three women, or the male ideal of women would be Cubist. And, uh, and uh, I happen to have Picasso hanging around my house. And um, that hasn't happened. So I, I, I agree with you that the, the Dutton is right and this, this professor is wrong, but it seems to me Dutton has two big loopholes. He concedes that there's one, an innate human desire for novelty, and two, that some things can develop like the peacock's tail, which is just males or, or maybe even females showing off to the opposite sex. Well, once you let those two loopholes in, you have, you, you have a wide field for just crazy artistic... Uh, you know, just go wild, completely depart from the Darwinian ideal, because it'll be, hey, novel, it'll be new. Yeah. Uh, and and well, uh, why, why doesn't that undermine the whole, well, you know, the whole scheme? The idea of the peacock's tail is not that novelty per se is what's attractive. It, it, it's that, first of all, there was originally some reason probably that, that before the peacock's tail was anywhere near as big in Florida as it is, that a... You know uh, that a, that a somewhat colorful tail actually signaled some kind of genetic quality, and females were attracted to it for that reason. There's a handicapping theory according to which the cumbersomeness of it signified genetic theory, but I, I, I'm not going to get into that, and, I, and 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 I don't really. But but novelty is our peacock's tail. Well, In other words, the way one shows off now is by coming up with a, a new idea. Well, first of all, let me get clear on the peacock's tail. The, the standard argument has been. It initially signaled some kind of genetic quality, but then there's a runaway effect because the very fact that females have a genetically based preference for a colorful tail means that in, 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 when, when males that have slightly more florid, slightly larger tails will have an advantage 
uh, and and so they, they uh, over females, and after that there's a, there's a circularity to the logic, so that the the the, uh, the 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 tails get get bigger just because females like them, and if females continue to like them for that reason, uh, you know, and and so on. So uh, that's that's different from the assertion that mere novelty, uh, and you wouldn't expect gratuitous novelty that doesn't have some kind of underlying logic uh, to as I understand it, to, to become part of your... Um, Gratuit I wouldn't either, but I just, in theory, I mean, gratuitous novelty could be the way we show off. So you get, you know, there is a car from BMW that looks a lot like a cubist Picasso woman. Well, coming up with uh, things like new ideas might be a, a sign of cleverness. People like, might like people who generate, you know, kind of linguistic novelty or, you know, make novel rhymes or something because it, it, it signals uh, sharpness or something. You, so you can imagine yeah. kinds of novelty yeah. being something you'd want to be attracted to. But there's something I, I wanted to stress about this. I have two things to say about, about your theory about cars, our, 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 okay. our, our car taste being kind of in our genes. One is... You know, the, 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 the general theory in, in evolutionary psychology is that these aesthetic tastes would be kind of domain-specific. In other words, you know, there would be one way that you're, that you're designed to evaluate landscapes, okay? So you like right. large, clear bodies of water more than you like, you know, stagnant swamps that look right. like they'd be ridden with disease, for example. Right. Um, and then there's a whole other way. You'd have a different template for evaluating other human beings, and, in fact, you might have somewhat distinct templates for evaluating males and females and so on. Now... I think in your blog or somewhere you said, well, maybe uh, there was some surface of some car you didn't like, and, and you said, well, maybe because it's, like, cratered, and that might have signified, I don't know, that some person was riddled with disease or something if they were pockmarked or something. I don't know. Right, anyway, you, I you, say that. The point is, I don't think a Darwinian would expect that kind of translation, that, that our aesthetic biases in the realm of evaluating human beings would transfer to an inanimate object like cars, um, and... A, can, I, can I address that? Yeah. I, I, did, I did say that, that, that maybe there'd be a genetic predisposition to liking smooth surfaces instead of pockmark surfaces, because pockmark surfaces would be associated with disease and open sores. And uh, What troubled me about the novelty exception in Dutton's article is, well, you know, if, novel, if we love novelty, well, a pockmark surface is novel, so we, you know, we might have some houses with pitted surfaces, as we, in fact, have a few. Uh, and and it, it, so it troubled me that, that, that well, the novelty fact, loophole seemed to undermine my theory. You're saying my theory wasn't good to begin with. So. Well, I, I think it suffered from that basic problem of, of trying to easily <laughs> tra transfer from one domain to another. Um, and, but also, don't you agree that there are certain kinds of pock surfaces, like, you know, lava? Is, don't you think lava is kind of cool when you run your hand over it? It's cool, yeah. And it's and it's like that, right? It's pitted. That's true. Okay, so I win. But I have another uh, question, which is okay. if, 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 if tastes in things like cars are hardwired, how come there is so much change in fashion over, over you know, one generation when there obviously couldn't be a uh, complete transformation of the gene pool? Uh, novelty. Okay, uh, so you're pe so you're back in uh, peacock's, peacock's tail. You, you, you're suddenly you're newly enthusiastic the, the, over this novelty theory, then. The basic no, no, I'm just tr I just haven't figured out where it fits in the whole thing. It does seem to me that the basic female form has not changed in in any appreciate. You know what the ideal female form has not oh, changed. Oh, the ideal the, female form, absolutely. I, I mean, there's the, a lot of the, evidence that, for example. Uh, a particular uh, waist to hip ratio uh, tends to be favored in different cultures, and that in turn correlates with fertility right. in women. And well, so clothes are just clothes. They clothe the basic female form, which is what we're hardwired for. So we don't have to worry about clothes. We don't have to, but you're the one who said things like cars, Man. and I would say clothes are kind of like cars in that they're artifacts yeah. that did not exist in the environment of our evolution yeah. in, in, a, in a relevant way. Um, Oh, but so it's logical that our minds would analogize them to the nearest thing we have around, which is women. As I said, I gotta say, I looked at that picture that you, of the car that you said looked like a woman, and I, I was going to have to ask you what body part was was analogous to what part of the car. I really didn't well, it's see got, it. It's got a, it's got a waist, it's got a narrow waist, and it's got hips, and it's got shoulders. It's it's sort of obvious. 
Well, I just think maybe but, you have somewhat more passion for cars than I do, Mickey. Uh, obviously. Um, well, okay. Um, we were in overtime. So compelling was that discussion. Yeah, we could go on for years, but we don't want to lose any of our viewership yeah. to another network. Um, no, uh, especially now that John Klein is hiring, uh, hiring pundits back oh, at that CNN. that reminds me. I've got to return his call. Thanks for that. Uh, okay, got to go. Yeah, okay. See you around. See ya.